Our next speaker, Brother Bruce Stelting, was born and raised in Carnage City, Texas. He was graduated from Southwest School of Bible Studies in 1989, participated in the graduate program and went to the School of Preaching in 1998 through 2000. He's done local work in Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, and he's been working with the Fish Hatchery Road Congregation in Huntsville, of Texas, since 2001. And he also serves there as one of their elders. Bruce has done mission work in the Philippines and in Cambodia. He preaches gospel meeting in gospel meetings and speaks on a number of lectureships. He's conducted evangelistic campaigns in Oklahoma and Kansas and Missouri, and worked with several Bible youth camps, as well as serving on the faculty of the Rose City. Bible Learning Center in Little Rock, Arkansas, and he is also serving at this time as one of the instructors for Truth Bible Institute. And let me just say a moment for those on the internet, if you're not aware of that, then you can go to churchesofchrist.com and find out about that. And uh, we've had a meeting today with the teachers and planning further things regarding the curriculum. We would encourage everybody anywhere, anybody anywhere or everywhere, to uh, look into studying with us in Truth Bible Institute. Bruce is going to come and speak to us now about a product from another Woodroof, Tim Woodroof, a church that flies. Well, I've always wanted to see that, so we we're going to hear something about it. And let me mention before you do this, Bruce, we are working right now, though we don't have anything in writing, although it looks good, we have met with a secular humanist group, I guess we'd say, uh, at the uh, University of Sam Houston in Huntsville. Uh, at their request, they came and visited Fish Hatchery Road this past September when we did an apologetics uh, lectureship on a Saturday, and uh, they were impressed, not, of course, with what we had to say much, but uh, those who were there recognized they conducted themselves uh, quite well. And we had a lively discussion, and they've approached us again through Bruce and two or three of us uh, from back, what, first January, I guess, had mentioned even last year uh, about uh, having a discussion, and we're in the process of uh, working that out. And we met with them a couple of weeks ago, and right now it looks like the way it's going to go, if we're going to have anything to do with it, will be a one night sometime in probably April, but only contingent upon a four-night debate this next fall. Uh, Brother Daniel Denham has agreed to come and, and speak on this one night whenever we can get it set up, which will be basically uh, two speeches apiece and then the question and answers. And we told them we were only interested in that as it would be sort of whetting the appetite and showing the need for a four-night debate completely unexperienced, inexperienced with uh, such debating as that, and it would be on uh, theistic evolution, at least the first one. They're willing, they say, to go and do one on atheism and offer to even uh, to do more. So uh, we'll see. It just possibly could be after Daniel has them for one night, the whole thing may end, but we'll see. Uh, we'll just see. Keep that in it's a great opportunity to, to do some real good, and please keep that in your prayers. Well, if, if we got buried there on that one night, say we need to spend one night in a four night deal, it would be <laughs> Where is he? He's being real nice back there. Uh, but I don't mind telling you, I would like to have Terry involved as far as what he knows and his ability. That's just no pun there, Terry. You can even bring your wife to that, too. <laughs> would you come speak to us, please, sir? that taken away from my time? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, just sitting in the audience, uh, listening to other people speak about different books uh, that have been written and the apostasy that these books promote, there's things common to each book and the ideas behind that, and I just wrote down just a few. 
uh, all of these people are dissatisfied with the Lord's church. They don't like it the way it is. They don't like the New Testament church. Um, they reject authority, uh, Bible authority. They reject a pattern principle in the New Testament, the Bible in general. Uh, every one of them, in order to change our way of thinking, has to come up with some new way to study the Bible. So we've talked quite a bit about new hermeneutics. Um, they're more interested in popularity than doctrine. Um, they're more interested in numerical growth than with uh, spiritual growth. They want to broaden our fellowship. They want to change our worship services into a charismatic experience. They want to take the church and change it from a unique institution to just one of another of many denominations. And they all seem to believe or have the idea that we owe our existence as the church today to the restoration movement. And so you're going to hear them uh, talk about our restoration roots or our restoration heritage. When you start hearing once sound brethren start referring to our restoration heritage, you better look out uh, because they're moving further and further away from the New Testament pattern. Well, this book is no different than the ones we've uh, just looked at. In fact, Tim Woodbrook is uh, a disciple of Rugal Cherry and Randall Harris, and he references the second incarnation uh, and uh, upholds it a great deal in this book and a lot of the principles that we've already talked about in other books are right here just in a different wrapper and so uh, these guys uh, there's really nothing new under the sun these guys are taking a maybe a little bit different approach to try to get to the same place which is really just as far away from the Lord's church as they possibly can get as fast as they can get there and uh, that's, that's the environment in which we live. And I, want to, I said all that to say this. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. You know, the people didn't like the church in the first century. They didn't like it when Jesus said he was going to build his church, and they killed him to try to prevent him from doing it. But the resurrection was something they didn't count on. And so on the... The day of Pentecost, Peter and the eleven stood up and said, This same Jesus you've crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. You can't stop the Lord from establishing his church, the one that he promised to build, the one that he purchased with his blood, Acts 20, verse 28. You can't stop it even by his death. In the first century, they didn't like the preaching of the gospel, and so they stoned Stephen to death. Did that stop the preaching of the gospel? No. Because of that event and the subsequent persecution, the church was scattered to the four winds, but everyone went everywhere preaching the gospel. And so that didn't stop it. Stephen, I mean uh, James, killed with the sword. Did that stop the church? No. The church continued. The church went into apostasy. And then we had men in what we would call the restoration movement. And they did what? They go back to the Bible, the seed, and they reestablished what Jesus promised to build. And that's what we have today. Not uh, a restoration root, not a, a heritage of the restoration, not a product of the restoration, but a product of the seed of the word of God, which when planted in truth will always produce the same thing it did in the first century. But that's what these men who have written these many books would have us to depart from that want to change, that want to transition, that want to do away with, who want to even say uh, to the extent that it never really existed except maybe in the mind of God. And that's from uh, the second incarnation. And so... When we, when we think about these, these men, we need to understand the danger that these men uh, uh, pose on maybe some unsuspecting brethren. You know, we talk about uh, church history, and many of us have, have made studies of church history. And so when they start talking about, well, Andrew, 
Alexander Campbell did this or Thomas Campbell did that or, or Barton W. Stone did the other. Uh, some men are quite capable of taking these men to task on that. But, you know, not every brother or sister in Christ has a background in church history is able to do that. And so they're easy prey for men that would write books like this. These guys prey on ignorant and unle unlearned brethren. And, and our brethren, in many cases, are ignorant and unlearned because we have failed in our job to teach them the first principles of the doctrine of Christ. And so it's, it's imperative. You know, we, you might scratch your head and say, why do we need two years of, of spring lectures to deal with these kind of books? Well, that's why. Because if these men are left to themselves and we ignore them and hope they'll go away, well, they will hurt the church. Will they destroy the church? No. People have been trying to destroy the church. Satan's been after the church since before it was even established. And it's still with us today. And it will continue to the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But friends and brethren, these types of works will hinder our efforts to promote Christianity in our common uh, time. We think about Woodruff in this book, uh, A Church That Flies, and he says it's a new call to restoration uh, in the churches of Christ. Uh, Woodruff desires change. In the very beginning of my manuscript, you look at the book, there's several quotes from different men uh, in the past that, that are change agents and what they want to do with the church, and, and I'm not going to go into that. I want to deal more at this time in the lecture with Woodruff and what he had to say. He desires change because he's become dissatisfied with the church, and he's been that way for quite some time. In fact, he say, states, to tell the truth, my heart knew something was wrong years before my head caught on. I have never been comfortable, he says, with the sectarian rhetoric of the one true church. Our exclusivism and isolationism seems to me to stem from equal parts arrogance and insecurity. And so those of us who would try to teach and bind one church and a pattern in the New Testament, we're arrogant and insecure. And that's his position. And, and basically he's saying, I've, I've risen above that. Woodruff states his, his theme. His theme is the, uh, the advocacy for change and for the discovery of new expressions of faith that represents the true restoration spirit, page 139. He seeks to help us discover unconventional forms for refreshed religious expression, page 138. He further states, central to this endeavor is a willingness to suggest it's possible to build a contemporary church that, <clears throat> let me get to my next page, that pleases God even if it does not look exactly like the church of the first or 19th century, page 9. And he admits many of us are growing frustrated with modern church that may look like the ancient church in the particulars, but fails to function with anything like its power and life-changing dynamics. Some, he says, are beginning to ask whether it might be possible to be the church of Christ today without focus on forms that have become our hallmark, page 8. Woodruff views the, the modern church as being in crisis with drastic measures needed in order to save it from dying uh, an agonizing death. He suggests and admits some of us are reviewing the state of the Church of Christ at the dawn of the 20th century are recognizing that drastic surgery is in order or else the patient may well expire on the table. Woodruff's frustration with his perception of the modern church motivates him to seek change that will remake the church into what he thinks it ought to be. Not what God thinks it ought to be, not what Christ thinks it ought to be, but what he thinks it ought to be. Remember, he's, he's unhappy with the church in which he grew up. He's not satisfied with that church, and so he wants to change it. He wants to remake it. And so what does he have to do? 
the first thing he does is attack the pattern of the New Testament, and that's something that every one of these men are going to do. But in doing so, when they reject the pattern, then they come over here and they say, this is what we ought to be. What are they doing? <laughs> they're right back to a pattern that they're denying that we have. And so we can see the inconsistency in their logic and reasoning right there. Woodruff doesn't concern himself with whether or not he has authority for such transformation and attacks New Testament patterns. In fact, he boldly quotes the statements of Shelley and Harris in the second incarnation that said the church need not have explicit mandate or permission for anything it wishes to do. Page 25. Early on, he declares, this is Woodruff, I call into question our reliance on pattern theology, page 29. He says, Antioch Christianity clearly establishes there never was the pattern we have so vehemently asserted, page 143. He says, these Jewish Christians were the first patternists of the Christian faith. They had discovered in those early innocent years of the church in Jerusalem a pattern for worshiping God, page 162. Let's consider the scope of his mission. The goal of the change agents in general, and Brother Woodruff in particular, is as follows. He says that goal is that ha uh, that goal uh, is that is a goal rather that has, I believe, the power to capture the children of the restoration movement, page 21. Thus, Woodruff is not content, and his cohorts, those that are writing books along with him, they're not content to change their own congregation into a charismatic denomination, but they're seeking to change the entire brotherhood, and that's including you and I. And so Woodruff's contempt for the church uh, <coughs> uh, is evident. He, uh, um, in fact, he ridicules the church in which his family grew up. And he is a fourth generation gospel preacher. His great grandfather was a preacher of 70 years. His grandfather was a preacher. His father was a preacher in New Zealand. He, he worked around Christ Church. And, and that's the James Woodruff of which we just studied his book, The Church in Transition. And now we have Jim Woodruff, his son, following his daddy's footsteps, this, this dissatisfied with the church. Now think of all the man hours uh, that this family, and not to mention uh, his brother that he says, uh, how did he put it, uh, made a uh, or spent a career at Harding College. Now I don't know whether he had spent a career at Harding College as a student or on the faculty, I don't know. He might have had trouble getting out of Harding College, but I assume he meant on the faculty. But think of, of all of these men, all of these man hours of Bible study, and then we end up with this family trying to take people away from the church. He's probably spitting in the eye of his great-grandfather. And so uh, and when we think about that, and, and, I, and again, that may be assumption on my part. I don't know. Maybe his grandfather's the one that started this departure from the faith. And we just see the end product in, in James and, and Tim Woodruff. Maybe that's what we're seeing here is the end product of, of maybe four generations of, of uh, gradual drifting from the foundations of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, clinging to old worship forms that have ceased calling us to a transforming experience of God is not faithfulness. Indeed, it represents a greater threat to the church than the worship innovations we've been taught to fear. Page 71 and 72. He says, furthermore, the stand of our brethren on the following topics, uh, he labels as defense of Mohill, and he talks about clerical titles. Worship styles, organizational structures, our method of interpreting the scriptures, the role of women, choirs, instrumental music, and so forth. He says those are, if, you, if you're going to take a stand on those issues, you're just making a, a mountain out of a molehill. Many of the practices and habits, he says, uh, bequeathed to us by the church of our fathers. See, not the New Testament, but the church of our fathers have lost all connection to contemporary minds and hearts. Once vivid forms, 
uh, with the passing of times have become dead ritual and minus liturgy and intrinsic, uh, intrinsic uh, I'm sorry, instinctive tradition, page 135. Let's look at his solution uh, to what he calls dead ritual and mindless liturgy. Woodruff states that there is an ideological tug of war uh, that is presently pulling at our fellowship. Yes, he's the one doing the pulling, and we're trying to anchor the faith uh, back to the Bible where it ought to be. They're the ones that are causing the tug of war. Uh, believing the church is stagnant and, and has outlived old worship form, Woodworth suggests the church must constantly be renovating its forms or innovating new forms that allow it to be God's living presence in the world, page 135. And so the church isn't static, doctrine isn't fixed, it has to change with times and generations and cultures. And that's some of the same thing that we've heard in every one of these reviews, that the church has to keep up with the times. It has to change to fit in with the culture. As if God didn't have the wisdom to, to establish a congregation in a body of doctrine and teaching that would be relevant in every culture and in every situation and during every time. How many cultural barriers were broken by the gospel in the first century? I submit to you, friends and brethren, if the gospel was multicultural in the first century and they went everywhere teaching the same thing to all the people in the first century, then we can do it today with the same results. And if we can't, then the problem isn't with the word, it's with the messenger, and that's us. We need to look at, at how we're presenting it and not try to change the message. He makes a distinction between form and function. He draws a parallel between the process of aviation and, and the supposed progress now being offered by the brotherhood. This is where he comes up with, with his title for his book, A Church That Flies. He argues that our first attempts at flight failed because we sought to imitate, um, that we thought to, wait, I lost my place. Here we go. Sought to imitate birds rather than develop the principles of flight. He argues, we, that would be those of us who had demanded, thus saith the Lord, have sought to imitate the first century church rather than build a church that is functional. Now, I don't know about you, but I know a little bit about aviation, and I've studied flight a little bit, and, and um, every aircraft that I've ever seen has some kind of wings on it, just like them birds, Right? Could we actually build an airplane that would fly without patterning it after the creation of the bird? Absolutely not. The wings form the same way a wing on a bird is made. You have to have thrust and lift. The thrust gives you lift on the wings, and that's how flight takes place. That's the same way it works with a bird. But yet, we can't, we can't follow that pattern of the bird to make something that flies. He writes like the ornithopterist of old. And by the way, the only value of this book is, is that you'll learn what an ornithopterist is. <laughs> or, like the ornithopterist of old, we assume that function was in, inextricably bound to form. That to fly with the first century church required us to fly like it. In our minds, a restoration of the first century spirit and dynamic would only be possible when we gave the modern church the same equipment as the ancient counterpart. Many of us are going frustrated with the modern church that may look, I'm re-quoting this, that may look like the ancient church in the particulars, but fails to function with anything like its power and life-changing dynamics, page 7 and 8. Now what does he mean by form? Well, form, he says, being what the New Testament church did and function being why the church did it, page 39. Well, you know, he's right to remind us that what we do, form, should be done in keeping with purpose, function. However, he's wrong to say all forms, that's how we do things, all forms are susceptible to a natural entropy 
Page 129, by entropy, Woodruff means that forms have a lifespan. He would, he would do well to remember the command of the Apostle Paul. He said, hold fast to the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. There's the form, and he says, hold fast to it. He said, if you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, Romans 6 and verse 17. And he says, Paul further says, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. Woodruff often makes exaggerated or false criticism of those preachers and churches that do not embrace his theology of change, page 122. It must be understood that by forms, Woodruff is not considering matters of judgment only. I would agree if he's just talking about matters of judgment, then yes, we may have different uh, judgment in this culture than they had in the first century. We may carry out uh, the commands of the first century maybe in a different manner or different method, but we don't give up the commands. But he means more than matters of judgment. He assures us we are reassessing everything from leadership styles to community involvement to long-cherished doctrinal positions, page 34. According to Woodruff, forms would include congregational and a cappella music, page 12, the organization of the church, page 38, congregational autonomy, page 76, the women's role in the church, page 120, careful exegesis, page 137, Assumptions about pattern and blueprint and dispensationalism and change, page 141. And what we would generally call Bible ways, page 47. In chapter 8, uh, which he entitles The Tyranny of the Tiny, Woman Woodruff says forms, that would be the, the method by which we worship and serve God. He said forms are tiny. Minor things, painful points, and this is scattered throughout the chapter, but I've condensed it here. Painful points, molehills, spiritual microscopia, uh, gnats, spiritual micrometers, theological specks, peripheral, minuscule, religious minutia, trivial, superficial, unimportant, unimportant, and it just doesn't matter. That's what he says about forms. I wonder what Cain and Uzzah and Nadab and Abihu would think about Woodruff's uh, assessment of forms. Each one of these violated a form that God commanded them to do. They violated the form of the commandment and not the function of the commandment. wonder what they would have to say. Would they have a right, according to Woodruff's uh, theology to complain to God for punishing them so harshly for their uh, uh, abandoning the form well uh, I think they would have a claim if Woodruff is right because he says there's never been a time when form was the primary concern with God or his creation well he's, in order to support this position that form doesn't matter he has to move to the new hermeneutics, and this is the way he does it. To make the changes that he desires, Woodruff, like all liberals before him, must reject the New Testament pattern. He suggests that there might be another way to do church today rather than focusing on and interpreting New Testament forms, page 18. To justify himself, he must call into question our reliance on pattern theology, page 29 and admit that holding on to dead forms is one of the greatest acts of unfaithfulness the church can commit, page 91. And there never was a pattern, page 143, to Woodruff, the way of preaching and practicing the faith of Jesus by those who believe uh, in and defend the New Testament pattern is beyond embarrassing, he says. It's mortifying. So we're embarrassing and mortifying to him if we hold to a New Testament pattern. And, and, and they say we're mean and harsh. 
in an effort to convince Christians to abandon the New Testament pattern, Woodruff implies that those before him have been reading the Bible incorrectly. He states, in order to read faithfully, we will need to read differently. See, all of us have been reading the Bible incorrectly. We haven't been doing it right. He says, I'm convinced that a rereading of the Bible will challenge our assumptions about change. Page 156 and 157. Woodruff accuses those who accept the New Testament pattern as having a restoration bias in their Bible study. He resorts to unfounded assumptions for support. And there's a long list of them. He says that the church, in, uh, the Jerusalem church was a congregation shaped as much by Moses and the custom of Israel as by Christ. Page 162. Jewish Christian worship was virtually indistinguishable from the worship of Orthodox Judaism. Page 163. I don't know what Bible he's been reading, but I've never noticed that point. When at last God forced the hand of the Jerusalem church and scattered those first Christians abroad, page 163. You know what he's talking about there? He's talking about the persecution in Acts chapter 8 that scattered the church of Jerusalem. And he said that was according to God's will. He called their hand and forced them abroad. The Holy Spirit had to win from Peter the grudging concession that Gentiles could be accepted into the church, page 164. Speaking of Antioch, he says, in this church we have the first specific record of kosher food laws being ignored by the, the Jewish Christians, page 165. He goes on to say, though we have, are, are told little about the manner in which the uh, Antioch church worship, it is safe to assume that the forms used to express worship were drawn from their native culture rather than a Jewish one, page 165. It's already been mentioned that Paul said, I teach every, the same thing in all the churches everywhere. And so why would the church at Jerusalem differ in worship than the church at Antioch? But he tries to contrast those throughout the book. Uh, he says, James and the elders at Jerusalem agreed that Gentiles would still be permitted to practice a different brand of Christianity than uh, Jerusalem Jews, page 171, and I have some other quotations there as well. His inter uh, interpretation of the sin of Nadab and Abihu in offering strange fire is remarkable. Remember, he cannot have sin of form, sin uh, if we violate a form, he can't have anybody condemned for violating the form. And so when, when Nadab and Abihu offer strange fire before the Lord, he has to deal with that. And so he doesn't deal with it in the text of the book, but if you go to the footnote, he deals with it there. Uh, by the way, read these guys' footnotes because you'll learn a lot from that. He says this, the sin of Nadab and Abihu may have nothing to do with innovations or some departure from a specifically commanded procedure. Rather, the text, Leviticus 10, suggests that the sin involved here was treating God and their important duties casually and carelessly, page 208. This sounds much like the interpretation of the homosexuals of the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. Rather than homosexuality, they say it was a lack of hospitality that God punished. When a man is intoxicated with the wine of liberalism, everything he views is distorted. Although Woodruff rejects the pattern concept, he still promotes a pattern. Although he rejects the pattern of forms, he maintains a pattern of function. He suggests that there are seven functions of the church. Now wait a minute. If there's no pattern, how does he know about these functions? You see, they, they, these guys want to hold on to the Bible and reject it at the same time. And the reason is they know if they come in the pulpit and say, we're going to throw this book away and we're never going to refer to it again and we're going to do whatever feels good to us and do whatever we want to do because there's no pattern in this book, they would be laughed out of the church. That's why the Bible says that false teachers sneak in privily. Privily. 
No false teacher is going to get up and wave a red flag and say, I'm ready to teach false doctrine. Are you ready to listen? They got to be sly about it. They got to be sneaky about it. And so they want to reject the New Testament. He would just as soon let this be our book that we teach rather than this one. That's what he wants. He wants to supplant the New Testament with his book. And he wants this to be our pattern, but he still has to say, well, in the church in the first century, there were seven forms. Well, where, where do you find that? Well, he goes to a long, drawn-out affair to, to get these seven forms listed. He says, where, he, he, uh, he says <coughs> regarding these forms, these then are the seven uh, components that are essential to building a, a functioning church. If something is essential and, and, and we enumerate it, that would be the pattern, wouldn't it? If it's essential, isn't that binding a doctrine? But he says there's no pattern, but now we have, well, you figure it out. Uh, they hold true, he says, for every manifestation of God's people across time and circumstance. They comprise the core, does that sound familiar, the core bullseye doctrine? The core of religious purpose for which God's people in every age are responsible, page 64. He thinks churches of Christ have often been guilty of confusing form and function and even ignoring vital forms altogether. Well, he says that forms are worship. There's seven of them. Worship, maintain holiness, be a community, mature one another, serve, witness, and influence the world. Whether or not he wants to admit, admit it, these seven forms or seven functions constitute a pattern. Well, let's see if his church will fly. If these seven forms won't fly, then his church will never get off the ground. Well, let's look at his charismatic worship function. Well, it just won't fly. Worship, he says, was not just an event for early Christians. It was an experience. It transported them to a holy place where they met with their Lord and experienced his power. He gives some references from 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. He says, and empowered by the Spirit, worship was a convincing, uh, a con a convincing uh, that God was present with them. According to Woodruff, biblical worship should never be confused with assemblies or rituals or behavior. Worship in Scripture, he says, is an experience of the presence of God. There's the charismatic idea, uh, page 55. Yet Paul stated, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to the Father by the Son. Now, <laughs> or by him. If we apply this command to worship, our actions and our behavior must conform to the authority of the Lord. This implies that what we do in worship, that's the form, is just as important as why we do it, that's the function. Now let's look at Woodruff's holiness function. Well, that won't fly either. He states, you cannot build a church that flies without a passionate pursuit of holiness. That sounds good, yet he asserts it's easy to confuse holiness. Now get this, it's easy to confuse holiness with ethical living doing the right thing and avoiding sin. However, according to Vines, the word holiness translated from hagios is, is used in the scriptures in its moral and spiritual significance, separated from sin and therefore consecrated to God, sacred. Vines, page 226. According to Woodruff, when the Christians pursue holiness, they participate in the nature of God in the walk of Jesus, and in the ongoing endeavors of the Holy Spirit. Though, uh, though Paul, he says, made lists of vices to avoid and virtues to attain, conformity to the list was never his aim. Conforming to Christ was his goal, page 72 and 73. Consider, let's look at two of the lists. There's many in the New Testament written by Paul. First, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. He lists all those sins. And then he says, 
shall not inherit or shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed and sanctified, and you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Notice that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Does that sound like conformity to this list was Paul's aim? In fact, Paul states that some brethren at Corinth had previously practiced those things listed. However, they ceased to practice them after their conversion. In so doing, they became holy. And Woodruff implies that one can uh, conform to Christ while still practicing those things that Paul condemns. The works of the flesh. Regarding the works of the flesh, Galatians 5, 19 through 20, Paul says, They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And of the fruit of the Spirit, he says, Against such there is no law. Now, the question is, can one be considered holy if he practices the works of the flesh and fails to develop the fruit of the Spirit? Well, according to Woodruff, such conforming to lists was never Paul's intention. So according to Woodruff, you can do all the works of the flesh you want, and you can never attain the fruit of the Spirit, and that's not what he was talking about anyway. By the way, if, if Paul didn't have us an intent that we would conform to those lists, why did he write them? Why would he write them? The context is going to determine whether or not Paul meant for us to conform to those lists and not Jim Woodruff. Now, I'm going to have to skip a whole bunch of stuff. Because <clears throat> that 40 minutes just goes too fast. Observations. There are many problems with Woodruff's approach to the Scripture. He accuses those uh, who hold New Testament pattern of bias of their study of the Scriptures. However, like Nathan of old, we have to say, Woodruff, thou art the man. Because he's studying the Bible through glasses of change. Okay? Everything he reads in the Bible, he looks at it from the standpoint of change. And therefore, it doesn't matter what we do, as long as, we do, as long as we're doing the right function, it doesn't matter how we do it. And so those forms can be cast aside. Form and function, though, cannot be separated. We must understand that the church was designed by God to function according to his purpose and according to his good pleasure, First, uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. Through his infinite wisdom, God designed a church that would function in any culture and in any generation, and no one can successfully alter God's form without incurring his wrath. Galatians 1, 8 through 9, Revelation uh, 22, 18 and 19. And not only that, but men do not determine function. It's not up to to Woodruff to set aside seven functions that he thinks we ought to be about. It's not his job. God is the one that determines function. Well, wherein lies the problems? Why do planes crash? Well, much of the time it's due to pilot error. However, being designed by men, planes are prone to, to mechanical failure, failure. Not so with the Lord's church. It is of divine design. And it's never going to fail. Thus, any problem or failure that may occur is not the fault of God. Blame must be placed on men for their failure to successfully carry out their role in the operation of the church. However, when placed in the capable hands of those who have read and understand and follow the instruction manual, the church will perform properly and fulfill the function for which God intended. A church that flies, a call to, to uh, restoration in the church of Christ is a handbook designed to change the Lord's church into a denomination. The final pages of this book are designed and comprised an 11 lesson study guide that he says are designed to be used in small group settings among friends in a class with a, a church's leadership and serve as a practical application and extension of certain principles contained in this book. Woodruff's book is a clear call to abandon the pattern set forth in the, in the Word of God, and by his own admission, Woodruff's book is filled 
pragmatic philosophy of the end justifies the mean, page 31. Although some of his criticism is just, his solution is unscriptural, and if followed will destroy the Lord's church. We must reject his church that flies for one that is founded upon the rock-solid foundation of God's word. His church won't fly, but his book needs to, and that's what we need to do with it. Throw it away. Just throw it away. Jesus said it best. Leave them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall in the ditch. Thank you for your time. Enjoy your food. Well, some of us that love books, even if that is an apostate thing, just tremble. <laughs> one time, and we were relating this one another, some of us the other day, uh, brother Floyd Wallace Jr. was driving somewhere, and his uh, wife was complaining to him about his hat. He always had a Stetson hat, and this one was well worn. And like most people in those days who wore hats all the time, they didn't want to give it up. And she was telling him, as the preacher he was, and the appearance he made to people, he, she, he should, she should have, or he should have a, a new hat. Continued to complain. Well, I believe, and I think Brother Dim and I remember that it was Brother Joe Gilmore that related this, for he was riding in the back seat of the car, said that uh, he, she just kept on at him about the hat, and he was sitting there just driving, saying nothing, and said, finally, he rolled down the window, just took his hat and threw it out the window. <laughs> that embarrassed Sister Wallace, and she felt like having to say something to Brother uh, Gilmore about his actions. And Brother Gilmore spoke up and said, well, I'm, I'm just glad that you weren't getting on him about his pants. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm just glad, I'm just glad that uh, you weren't dealing with somebody's pants. So we would have had a spectacle to behold from now till doomsday. Well, anyway. Maybe that woke us up a little bit. You know, Judas Iscariot had the closest personal relationship with Jesus Christ on this earth that is possible for a human being to have. I want to know what that personal relationship and experience with Christ did for Judas. Nothing. Because the thing, even when you walked with Jesus as close as two fleshly humans could, you still had to believe in him, and you still had to accept his word to believe in him, and you still had to obey what he said. That's the problem with all these folks. They have no more faith in Jesus Christ than I do in the Pope of Rome. Well, I have faith in him to be the Pope of Rome, but that's all. <laughs> I think I know he'll do that. But uh, that's, that's the whole situation. So all this personal experience stuff that a person's supposed to have with somebody, with Christ. Personal experience with Jesus means nothing. You can't outdo what, Je what Judas Iscariot had with Jesus Christ. And it did him no good at all because he had no faith in the man as a son of God and took, taking him at his word. And today, that's exactly where these people are. They have no faith in Christ based on the teaching of the Bible and they hate what it says. And they'll sell him for not 30 pieces of silver, but 30 pennies as far as we're concerned. They have no respect, and they can say what they want to. They can appear pious. None of these fellows love the Lord, and they hate anything about him. I don't care how well they smell, how educated they are, how talented they are in the pulpit, how well they dress, by their fruits you shall know them. And when they deny the truth of God's word and go to changing it all about, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. Thus, they're ravening wolves, ready to devour. We stand dismissed till about six minutes, five minutes or so, and then we'll come back for open forum. If you have questions, I need to get them now if you'll give them to me. Thank you.